The ingenious of Panama Canal, the biggest hydro project ever. The Panama Canal, an engineering marvel and a pivotal conduit in global maritime trade, presents a fascinating subject that intertwines history, engineering, geopolitics, and environmental science. Spanning approximately 82 kilometers or approximately 51 miles across the Isthmus of Panama, it connects the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, significantly shortening the maritime route and altering global trade dynamics. So, is the Panama Canal still the biggest hydro project ever completed? Let's find out. The deal behind the project. The Panama Canal was first developed following the failure of a French construction team in the 1880s when the United States commenced building a canal across a 50-mile stretch of the narrow Panama Isthmus in 1904. The project was helped by the elimination of disease-carrying mosquitoes, while chief engineer John Stevens devised innovative techniques and spurred the crucial redesign from a sea level to a lock canal. His successor, Lieutenant Colonel George Washington Gothels, stepped up excavation efforts of a stubborn mountain range and oversaw the building of the dams and locks. Opened in 1914, oversight of the world-famous Panama Canal was transferred from the United States to Panama in 1999. On November 6, 1903, the United States recognized the Republic of Panama, and on November 18, the hay buna Varilla Treaty was signed with Panama granting America exclusive and permanent possession of the Panama Canal Zone. In exchange, Panama received $10 million and an annuity of $250,000 beginning nine years later. The treaty, negotiated by U.S. Secretary of State John Hay and French engineer Philippe Jean Buna Varilla, was condemned by many Panamanians as an infringement on their country's new national sovereignty. Seemingly not grasping the lessons from the French effort, the Americans devised plans for a sea-level canal along the roughly 50-mile stretch from Cologne to Panama City. The project officially commenced with a dedication ceremony on May 4, 1904, but Chief Engineer John Wallace encountered immediate problems. Much of the French equipment was in need of repair, while the spread of yellow fever and malaria was frightening off the workforce. Under pressure to keep construction moving forward, Wallace instead resigned after a year. A railroad specialist named John Stevens took over as chief engineer in July 1905 and immediately addressed the workforce issues by recruiting West Indian laborers. Stevens ordered new equipment and devised efficient methods to speed up work, such as the use of a swinging boom to lift chunks of railroad track and adjust the train route for carting away excavated material. He also quickly recognized the difficulties posed by landslides and convinced Roosevelt that a lock canal was best for the terrain. The project was helped immensely by Chief Sanitary Officer Dr. William Gorgas, who believed that mosquitoes carried the deadly diseases indigenous to the area. Gorgas embarked on a mission to wipe out the carriers, his team painstakingly fumigating homes and cleansing pools of water. The last reported case of yellow fever on the Isthmus came in November 1905, while malaria cases dropped precipitously over the following decade. Although construction was on track when President Roosevelt visited the area in November 1906, the project suffered a setback when Stevens suddenly resigned a few months later. Incensed, Roosevelt named Army Corps engineer Lieutenant Colonel George Washington Gothels the new chief engineer, granting him authority over virtually all administrative matters in the building zone. Gothels proved a no-nonsense commander by squashing a work strike after taking charge but he also oversaw the addition of facilities to improve the quality of life for workers and their families. The construction and its dangers. Gothel's focused efforts on Culebra Cut, the clearing of the mountain range between Gamboa and Pedro Miguel. Excavation of the nearly nine mile stretch became an around the clock operation with up to 6,000 men contributing at any one time. Despite the attention paid to this phase of the project, Culebra Cut was a notorious danger zone as casualties mounted from unpredictable landslides and dynamite explosions. Construction of the locks began with the pouring of concrete at Gatun in August 1909, built in pairs with each chamber measuring 110 feet wide by 1,000 feet long. The locks were embedded with culverts that leveraged gravity to raise and lower water levels. Ultimately, the three locks along the canal route lifted ships 85 feet above sea level to the man-made Gatun Lake in the middle. Hollow, buoyant lock gates were also built, varying in height from 47 to 82 feet. The entire enterprise was powered by electricity and ran through a control board. The completion phase. 
The grand project began drawing to a close in 1913. Two steam shovels working from opposite directions met in the center of Culebra Cut in May, and a few weeks later, the last spillway at Gatun Dam was closed to allow the lake to swell to its full height. In October, President Woodrow Wilson operated a telegraph at the White House that triggered the explosion of Gamboa Dyke, flooding the final stretch of the dry passageway at Culebra Cut. The Panama Canal officially opened on August 15, 1914, although the planned grand ceremony was downgraded due to the outbreak of World War I. Completed at a cost of more than $350 million, it was the most expensive construction project in U.S. history to that point. Altogether, some 3.4 million cubic meters of concrete went into building the locks, and nearly 240 million cubic yards of rock and dirt were excavated during the American construction phase. Many people, however, died building the Panama Canal. Of the 56,000 workers employed between 1904 and 1913, roughly 5,600 were reportedly killed, though the actual number is probably much higher since the French only recorded deaths that occurred in hospitals. The Panama Canal cost the United States around $375 million, including the $10 million paid to Panama and $40 million paid to the French when they abandoned the project. At the time, it was the most expensive construction project in U.S. history. The operation process. The canal locks operate by gravity flow of water from Gatun, Alajuela, and Miraflores lakes, which are fed by the Chagres and other rivers. As earlier mentioned, the locks themselves are of uniform length, width, and depth, and were built in pairs to permit the simultaneous transit of vessels in either direction. So, how do they work? Each lock gate has two leaves, 65 feet wide and 6.5 feet thick set on hinges. The gates range in height from 46 to 82 feet. Their movement is powered by electric motors recessed in the lock walls. They are operated from a control tower, which is located on the wall that separates each pair of locks, and from which the flooding or emptying of the lock chambers is also controlled. The lock chambers are 1,000 feet long, 110 feet wide, and 40 feet deep. Because of the delicate nature of the original lock mechanisms, only small craft are allowed to pass through the locks unassisted. Larger vessels are guided by electric towing locomotives, which operate on cog tracks on the lock walls and serve to keep the ship centered in the lock. Before a lock can be entered, a fender chain stretched between the walls of the approach must be passed. If all proceeds properly, that chain will be dropped into its groove at the bottom of the channel. If, by any chance, the ship is moving too rapidly for safety, the chain will remain stretched and the vessel will run against it. The chain, operated by hydraulic machinery in the walls, will pay out slowly by automatic release until the vessel has been brought to a stop. If the vessel should get away from the towing locomotive and, breaking through the chain, ram the first gate, a second gate 50 feet away will protect the lock and arrest further advance. The third lock systems of the third set of locks project, begun in 2007, were inspired by the Berendrick lock in Antwerp, Belgium, and water-saving basins used in the canals in Germany. Some 190,000 tons of steel, mostly from Mexico, are entrenched in heavily reinforced concrete to build the lock chambers on the Atlantic and Pacific sides, and the new lock gates measure up to 33 feet wide, 98 feet high, and 190 feet long. The new chambers and basins, which will control the water flowing from Gatun Lake, were designed to minimize the turbulence of water flow and the disturbance to transiting vessels. The basins were completed in June 2016 and include 158 valves consisting of 20,000 tons of structured material. Officials say those water-saving basins are the largest in the world and facilitate a 60% water reuse. Whereas the existing locks use 52 million gallons with each use, the new locks use 40 48 million gallons. The maintenance. Continual maintenance work on the canal and its associated facilities is needed to keep it in operation in a tropical climate. That includes dredging channels, scheduling overhauls of locks, and repairing and replacing machinery. Because of heavy rainfall and unstable soils, landslides in the hills adjoining Gallard Cut have been an intermittent problem since the canal was built. Preventive and remedial measures have frequently been taken to keep the channel open, and a program to stabilize its banks was designed to draw away rainfall that might otherwise undercut its slopes. Two major slides have occurred since 1970, the first in 1974 and the second in 1986. In both cases, one-way traffic had to be imposed for a time in the affected area. Another serious problem threatening the canal has been the increased siltation and sedimentation 
degradation rate of the rivers and streams of the watershed and ultimately of the canal itself. The degradation has been caused by the slash and burn agricultural techniques practiced by local migratory farmers. Although the canal watershed was still completely forested in the early 1950s, by the late 1970s, it had been reduced by nearly 70%. Measures to control soil erosion have been undertaken by the governments of both the United States and Panama. The impact. Bolstered by the addition of Madden Dam in 1935, the Panama Canal proved a vital component in expanding global trade routes in the 20th century. The transition to local oversight began with the 1977 treaty signed by U.S. President Jimmy Carter and Panama leader Omar Torrios, with the Panama Canal Authority assuming complete control on December 31, 1999. Recognized by the American Society of Civil Engineers as one of the seven wonders of the modern world in 1994, the canal hosted its one millionth passing ship in September 2010. The United States continues to be the heaviest user of the Panama Canal. 66% of its cargo traffic began or ended its journey at a U.S. port, while cargo from or to China made up 13% of its traffic, according to 2019 data. Today, the Panama Canal remains one of the biggest projects of the early 20th century and will remain so for many more years to come. And that's it from us today. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to click on the subscribe icon below. Also, give us a like, share the video, and remember to turn on the notification bell for timely updates of our latest uploads. Until next time, thank you for watching.